October 1st, 2003, Naples, Florida. A Mexican national named Felipe Santos gets into a traffic accident and mysteriously disappears after he is taken into police custody. Three months later, an African-American man named Terrence Williams also vanishes after being pulled over for a traffic stop. Incredibly, both men were last seen in the custody of the same police officer. After that, the trail went cold. I have a car from Vanderbilt on 111th Monday, a Cadillac. Do you remember it? No. Do you remember? She said it was near the cemetery. Cemetery. Hey, the people are at the cemetery are telling her you put somebody in the back of your vehicle and arrested them, and I don't show you arresting anybody. I never arrested nobody. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth episode of The Trail Went Cold. I am your host, Robin Warder, and that sound bite you just heard was a recording of a conversation between a police dispatcher and a Collier County Sheriff's deputy named Steve Calkins. And I'm going to explain the context of that conversation a little later on. Today, I am going to be covering a case which I previously featured in an article I wrote for listverse.com, 10 Controversial Missing Persons Cases, which was originally published in August 2013. And boy, does this case redefine the term controversial. As you probably know, one of the most controversial subjects in America within the last few years has been the police and their treatment of minorities. And as you've seen in places like Ferguson, Missouri, and Baltimore, there can be protests and civil unrest if the public believes the police are responsible for the unjust death of a suspect who happens to be a minority. Well, this topic kind of ties into the case I'm going to be covering today. But let me tell you, you've probably never heard of a case like this one. I'm not talking about victims who died under suspicious circumstances at the hands of the police. I'm talking about people who flat out disappeared at the hands of the police. But before we get started, I want to thank everyone who listens to and supports this podcast. In particular, I'd like to thank the fine folks from the Unsolved Mysteries Forum at the Sitcoms Online message board, and all the posters at the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit for all your comments and feedback on the first few episodes. We're starting to pick up more and more followers with each episode, and I'm extremely happy with how things have been going so far. The Trail Went Cold runs on a bi-weekly schedule, and a new episode is posted every other Wednesday. We've now got our own Facebook and Twitter pages, and we're also available for download on iTunes, so if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it. I need to provide the obligatory shout-out to McGill Foote, who edits and assembles this podcast together for me, and is my fellow co-owner of The Back Row, the pop culture website which hosts this podcast. And, of course, a big shout-out to Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode. Uh, you might have noticed that he's provided some new creepy music tracks for our most recent episode, so what can I say? The guy is very talented. So, uh, anyway, let's get started on today's mystery. Our story begins in Florida in 2003. The uh, first central figure in our mystery is 24-year-old Felipe Santos. Uh, Felipe is a Mexican national who resides in the town of Imocali, and he has a wife and newborn baby daughter. Uh, Felipe has been living in the U.S. for the past three years, but he is technically an illegal alien who has been sending some of the money he earns back to his family in Mexico. Uh, anyway, during the first few years in the U.S., Felipe has been making his living as a migrant worker, but he and his two brothers have recently gotten themselves much better jobs in construction. However, since this job is located 30 miles away from where they live, uh, Felipe and his brothers have to acquire themselves a car in order to drive to work every day. Uh, and they do this even though none of them have a driver's license. Anyway, on the morning of October 1st, Felipe is driving to work with his brothers when he gets into an accident in the town of Naples. Uh, the accident is a pretty minor one, as no one is hurt and there isn't any serious damage to either of the vehicles, but a police officer shows up at the scene. And ladies and gentlemen, this is Corporal Steve Calkins, who is going to turn into quite a controversial figure in the story. And yes, he is the same Collier County Sheriff's Deputy whom you heard during my intro. Of course, this situation presents a problem for Felipe because he is driving without a license and without insurance. So uh, Calkins, he puts Felipe into the back of his patrol car and drives away, presumably to take him to jail. But this turns out to be the last time anyone ever sees Felipe Santos. So, uh, Felipe's boss is notified about the incident and he agrees to bail Felipe out, but when he contacts the local jail, there is no record of him. In fact, there is no record of Felipe ever being booked anywhere in the town. Uh, Felipe doesn't return home, and his family and friends never hear from him, so of course they decide to press the police department for information. Corporal Calkins is finally questioned, and he gives a pretty unusual story. He claims that Felipe was such a polite and cooperative person that he wanted to spare him the ordeal of taking him to jail. 
Instead, he took Felipe to a nearby Circle K convenience store and dropped him off in the parking lot, where Felipe could go use a payphone to call for a ride. But Calkins also wrote Felipe three separate citations for reckless driving, driving without a license, and driving without insurance. Uh, combined, these three offenses will total $2,000 in fines, and they will also require Felipe to appear in court the following month. Calkins even provides copies of these citations to back up his story. Now, of course, Calkins' story does seem a little suspect, as the other motorist who was involved in the accident, uh, she claims that Calkins was very agitated when he arrived at the scene and took Felipe away, and that he was openly complaining about how tired he was of having to pull over people who didn't have licenses. Uh, he apparently did not have the attitude of someone who would decide to cut a guy a break because they were polite and cooperative. But it's also not that implausible that Felipe could have disappeared on his own. Uh, if Felipe showed up at his scheduled court date, this situation could provide a lot of potential problems for him since he was in the country illegally and he could face possible deportation. Uh, initially, the Collier County Sheriff's Office holds the attitude that Felipe has gone into hiding or even fled back to Mexico to avoid his legal troubles. However, after not hearing from him for two weeks, Felipe's family decides to file a missing persons report and they also file a formal complaint about Corporal Calkins. Uh, an internal investigation is done by the police and while they do find it a bit unusual that Calkins decided to cut Felipe loose at the Circle K, they ultimately determine that he did not violate any procedures and they clear him of any wrongdoing. Of course, uh, this is very frustrating for Felipe's family as they feel the police are not taking the investigation that seriously because Felipe is an illegal immigrant. Well, guess what? <laughs> Within the next few months, Felipe's disappearance would get more attention than they ever could have imagined. So now we will move on to the next figure in our mystery, Terrence Williams. Uh, at the time, Terrence was a 27-year-old African-American man living in Naples. He originally grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and he had a bit of a tumultuous life early on. Uh, he had some brushes with the law, and he even did some time in prison during the 1990s for aggravated robbery. Uh, Terrence also fathered four different children with four different women, and he was falling behind on paying all his child support to them. And on top of everything else, he also had his license suspended in 2001 because of a DUI. However, it did appear that Terrence was making a sincere attempt to turn his life around. Uh, he moved from Tennessee to Florida to live near his mother, whom he was incredibly close to. Uh, Terrence found a job in construction, and in order to make extra money to help him catch up with his child support payments, he also took a second job at Pizza Hut. Of course, since Terrence's license was suspended, he had to rely on his mother and his roommate to drive him around. But uh, since he was going to get his license back in a couple months, Terrence did save up enough money to purchase himself an unregistered Cadillac, and he was planning to use it as his transportation once he could legally drive again. However, on the evening of January 11, 2004, Terrence was invited to a party at a co-worker's house. Uh, he asked his roommate for a ride that night, but since the roommate was unable to do so, Terrence decided to take a chance. Even though he had no license and no insurance and the vehicle was unregistered, Terrence decided to use his new Cadillac to drive himself to the party. Uh, Terrence arrived, and he was last seen leaving the party sometime between 5 and 6 a.m. the following morning. But uh, after that, he just vanished. Terrence never arrived home, he missed his next three shifts at work, and he seized contact with everyone he knew, including his mother, whom he talked to nearly every day. In fact, just two days after his disappearance, Terrence had a court date scheduled in Knoxville, Tennessee to discuss the back pay on his child support. And when Terrence didn't show up for the hearing, a warrant was issued for his arrest. Of course, uh, Terrence's mother attempted to file a missing persons report, but had, hard, but had a hard time getting the police to take them seriously, since Terrence was an adult and could legally disappear if he wanted to. But uh, even though Terrence himself never turned up, his family was able to track down his missing Cadillac, and they found out it had been towed away from the entrance of Naples Memorial Cemetery on January 12th. A police officer had called in the tow because the Cadillac was obstructing traffic. And take a wild guess whose name was on the tow report. Corporal Steve Calkins. Uh, Terrence's mother then contacted some workers from the Naples Cemetery, and they provided a pretty interesting story. On the morning of January 12th, they witnessed Terrence's Cadillac being pulled over by a patrol car driven by Corporal Steve Calkins. Uh, they both stepped out of their respective vehicles, and from a distance, it appeared that Calkins was asking Terrence for identification. When Terrence said he didn't have any ID, Calkins patted him down and placed him in the back of his patrol car. Calkins then went over and asked the cemetery workers if he could leave Terrence's car in the lot. And when they said yes, Calkins drove away with Terrence in the back seat. And as far as anyone knows, this is the last official sighting of Terrence Williams. The uh, cemetery's employees would then claim that Calkins returned to the scene a short time later, though the actual timeline is a bit wonky here. Some of the witnesses seem to think that Calkins returned within 15 minutes, but others think he was gone for as long as an hour. But they do all claim they saw Calkins move Terrence's Cadillac to a different spot by the side of the road, and strangely, Calkins left the keys on the ground next to the vehicle. And shortly thereafter, Calkins called in the report to have the Cadillac towed away. So, needless to say, Terrence's mother found this story very weird, so she kept pressing the Collier County Sheriff's Office to question Calkins. 
So a police dispatcher contacts Calkins at home on his day off, and this is where the recording of the conversation from the beginning of this podcast originates from. As you heard, Calkins would claim that he had no memory of pulling over Terrence Williams or towing his car away. And keep in mind, this conversation took place only four days after the alleged incident, so Terrence's mother found it pretty unbelievable that Calkins could not remember it. But a short time later, Calkins would be given a more thorough questioning from investigators, and he finally provided them with a full story about what happened. And I'm just going to say this right up front. Your bullshit detectors are probably going to go into overload. So, according to Calkins, he pulled Terrence over because his Cadillac was having engine problems. But Terrence's family disputes this assertion because they claim there was nothing wrong with the car. Anyway, Calkins then asked Terrence for ID, but of course, he doesn't have any. And here's where this story gets hinky. Calkins claims that Terrence tells him that he is running late for work and begs him for a ride there. Terrence assures the officer that all the paperwork for the vehicle is in the glove box, but he desperately needs to get to work right now. So if Corporal Calkins could kindly drop him off, leave the Cadillac behind at the cemetery, and then return to check the registration afterwards, that would be great. And according to Calkins, that's exactly what he did. He agreed to put Terrence into his patrol car and give him a ride to work. Oh, and what was this so-called workplace where Calkins said he dropped him off? A Circle K convenience store. <laughs> no, it wasn't the same Circle K store where Calkins supposedly dropped off Felipe Santos, but that is quite a coincidence. Anyway, according to Calkins, he drove back to the cemetery, checked the Cadillac's glove box, and found out there was no registration in there. And then he realized that Terrence had lied to him. Apparently, during their time together, Terrence had only introduced himself by his first name, so at this point, Calkins doesn't even know the guy's last name. So Calkins calls the Circle K from his cell phone to try and get a hold of him, but they tell him that nobody named Terrence works there. So, of course, Calkins feels completely duped and decides to call in a tow truck to take the Cadillac away. Shockingly, Terrence Williams' family do not find this story to be entirely believable. And shockingly, I'm inclined to agree with them. I mean, just picture yourself in a hypothetical situation like Corporal Calkins described. You're driving in a vehicle with expired tags, you've got no license, you've got no registration, you've got no insurance, and then you're pulled over by the police. What do you think is going to happen if you try saying this? Oh, sorry officer, I know I don't have any ID on me, but I'm running really late for work. Would you mind giving me a ride to my place of employment? You can just drive back to my car and check the registration later. Hope it's not too inconvenient for you. Yeah, just imagine what their reaction would be. I don't care if you're dealing with the nicest police officer in history, there's zero chance he's driving you to work. The only place you're going in a situation like that is jail. But if you think Terrence's mother is fuming now, just wait until she finds out about Felipe Santos. Just wait until she hears that another man mysteriously disappeared after being taken into custody by Corporal Calkins, and that he also vanished after Calkins claimed he dropped him off at a Circle K convenience store, and that this happened only three months before Terrence went missing. Needless to say, Terrence's mother filed a formal complaint, and given the suspicious coincidental nature of these two disappearances, the Collier County Sheriff's Department would call in the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and the FBI to assist them with their investigation. And not surprisingly, it eventually gets to the point where Corporal Calkins is caught in several lies. Investigators would uncover a recording of some of the calls Calkins made to dispatch on January the 12th, and they would contradict parts of his story. Here's a recording of one of these calls. I got a homie Cadillac on the side of the road here. Signal 11, signal 52, nobody around. Maybe he's out there in the cemetery. <laughs> Come back in his car, I'll be gone. Yes, folks, Calkins actually referred to the vehicle as a homie Cadillac. Classy. Anyway, you'll notice that Calkins makes no mention at all of pulling over Terrence Williams, and simply claims that he found the Cadillac abandoned near the cemetery. And a short time later, he makes this call to dispatch. Uh -huh. Williams, how much going? Say first. Four. Whoop. Seventy-five. Black now. Now, remember what Calkins said in his original statement? He claimed that Terrence only introduced himself by his first name and never gave his last name. Yet here he is asking for a background check on Terrence Williams. And here's an interesting anecdote about the birth date he provides. Terrence's real birth date is January 17th, 1976. But whenever Terrence had run-ins with the law, he had a tendency of providing the police with a fake birth date, which happens to be April 1st, 1975. And yes, that happens to be the exact same date that Calkins used over the radio, which seems to prove that they interacted with each other. And the lies just keep piling up. Uh, Calkins' cell phone records are checked, and there is no record of him ever making a call to the Circle K that day to ask if Terrence worked there. And no Circle K employee ever acknowledges taking such a call. There's also no sign of Terrence or Calkins on any of the Circle K surveillance footage that day. But here's something weird. The police announced that they could find no witnesses who saw either man at the Circle K. But for some reason, one of the employees did give an interview with the press where she claimed that she saw Calkins using the store's bathroom and Terrence filling a container with gasoline before he left. However, as far as I can tell, the police have never publicly acknowledged this witness's story, so I'm not sure if they find the sightings to be credible. 
But any way you slice it, Calkin's story has completely fallen apart, and after an internal investigation, he is eventually fired by the police force. Now, Calkin's made a failed attempt to appeal his dismissal, and he's always maintained his innocence, claiming that he had nothing to do with either man's disappearance, and that he became a scapegoat in a highly charged political situation. And to this day, no one has found any evidence to file criminal charges against Calkin's. A search was performed of his patrol car, and it was found to be spotless, but there is no hard evidence of foul play. Uh, Naples is in close proximity to the Florida Everglades, and a bunch of searches have been performed of isolated wooded areas surrounding the town, but uh, thus far no trace has ever been found of either Felipe Santos or Terrence Williams. Uh, after the initial controversy, this case kind of stayed off the radar for the next couple years, but publicity started to increase around 2012 when the case drew the attention of the Reverend Al Sharpton and the NAACP. Uh, ever since then, it's been profiled on such true crime shows as Dateline and Disappeared, and one of its biggest advocates is actor Tyler Perry, who has offered a $100,000 reward for information. However, in spite of all this extra coverage, the trail went cold. So, all I can really say here is, wow. <laughs> There have been a lot of controversial stories about police misconduct, especially when it comes to the treatment of minorities, but I don't think you'll find a more baffling one than this. After everything I've just told you, I'm sure you're expecting me to rake Steve Calkins over some hot coals. Uh, since this story took place in Florida, you might be having Dexter flashbacks right about now and are picturing Calkins as some sort of racist cop serial killer. But I just don't know. I mean, don't get me wrong, I do not think Calkins is a completely innocent person by any means. But I'm just not sure this case is quite as cut and dried as it looks on the surface. Any way you look at it, this whole situation just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I'd be more inclined to think Calkins committed murder if he had a checkered history of police brutality, misconduct, or racism, but that's just not the case. Calkins was a 17-year veteran, and as far as I can tell, he had a pretty clean record, and he had no history of trouble. In fact, he even received a couple of commendations. With a record like that, it actually makes sense that the department would give him the benefit of the doubt on the Felipe Santos disappearance and clear him of any wrongdoing. If the story had just ended there, I don't think anyone would be discussing this case today. Uh, I have no idea what Calkins has been doing for a living since he was fired, as he never does interviews with the media, and he keeps himself out of the spotlight. But as far as I can tell, he hasn't been in any more trouble these past 12 years. Now, after listening to the recordings of all these calls, he... Now, after listening to the recording of all those calls he made to dispatch, I'm reasonably comfortable assuming that Steve Calkins is an asshole. But is he a killer? Why would a guy ruin a perfectly good 17-year police career to murder two people who were caught driving without a license? What could this guy's motive possibly be? And after being suspected in the disappearance of one person and being cleared as a suspect, how brazen do you have to be to make another person disappear just three months later? And in both cases, provide the exact same fake story about dropping your victim off at a Circle K. I mean, I suppose it's not impossible that Calkins is some sort of narcissistic sociopath who decided to commit two murders within the course of three months just to see if he could get away with it. After all, both Felipe Santos and Terrence Williams were ideal targets for this sort of thing because they were both in a very vulnerable position. Both of them had technically broken the law by driving without a license or insurance. Both of them had a lot to lose if they were taken to jail. And on the surface, both of them had plausible reasons to disappear on their own, especially after warrants were issued for their arrests. But my god, if Calkins wanted to become some sort of serial killer, he sure did a piss poor job of covering his tracks. He took Felipe into custody in front of his two brothers and another independent witness. He spoke directly with witnesses at the cemetery when he took Terrence into custody. He made arrangements to tow Terrence's car and he put his name all over the paperwork. He claims to have dropped both men off at a public place which he knows is going to have surveillance cameras which could potentially disprove his story. As a veteran police officer, Calkin should know better than anyone that if he were to murder these two men and make them disappear, a lot of people are going to be asking questions and the investigation is going to immediately be traced to him. Given the circumstances, I just don't see how Calkins could have ever expected to get away with this. Which is why I'm not 100% convinced that there was premeditated murder here. And plus, there's also a time frame issue. According to witnesses, Calkins was seen returning to the cemetery between 15 minutes and one hour after he drove off with Terrence. And even if Calkins was away for an entire hour, that's still not a lot of time to murder someone and dispose of their body so thoroughly that it hasn't been found in 12 years. Now, in Calkins' defense, he did initially pass two lie detector tests. But on the third test, he did show signs of deception on certain questions, mostly about whether or not he saw Terrence again after dropping him off at the Circle K. I was almost starting to envision a situation where Terrence might have bribed Calkins not to arrest him. This would explain why Calkins would do such a piss-poor job at fabricating a cover story. In his eyes, he committed a minor indiscretion by accepting a bribe, but he did not expect Terrence to just disappear or for such a huge investigation to take place. But if the worst thing Calkins did do was accept a bribe, what happened to Terrence afterwards? That's really the most troubling part for me, 
As an illegal, undocumented immigrant, it's not impossible that Felipe could have fled back to Mexico and managed to stay off the radar these past 12 years. But I just don't see how Terrence could remain hidden for so long unless he was dead. So, is there a scenario where Calkins could have made both of these guys disappear without actually murdering them? Well, as a matter of fact, there is. While researching this case, I've come across a lot of different theories on the internet about what might have happened. But I gotta say, my personal favorite theory that I found is the Starlight Tour. If you're not familiar with the term Starlight Tour, this is a practice where police officers will pick up vulnerable suspects for minor crimes, but instead of making a formal arrest or taking them to jail, they'll punish the suspect by driving them a long way outside the city limits and dropping them off in the middle of nowhere, and it usually takes place at night and the suspect is forced to find their own way back home. Uh, this term originated in Canada, where it's been a common practice for racist, unethical police officers to give the Starlight Tour to Aboriginal people they've picked up. Unfortunately, on more than one occasion, this practice has led to a tragic death. In Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, there are numerous documented cases of Aboriginal men being picked up by police and dropped off on the outskirts of town at night, in the middle of winter, in minus 30 degree weather. And sadly, some of these people wound up freezing to death before they made it back to town. So, what if something like that happened in this particular case? What if Steve Calkins did not deliberately murder Felipe Santos or Terrence Williams, but instead took them out on some sort of starlight tour, which went horribly wrong? You see, the reason cops think they can get away with these starlight tours is because they target suspects who have just broken the law and are unlikely to raise a fuss about it. For example, if Felipe Santos was given a starlight tour and wanted to file a formal complaint about it, he would run a serious risk of facing his own legal troubles and face possible deportation. And the same thing goes for Terrence Williams. So if Calkins was in the habit of giving starlight tours, both Felipe and Terrence would make ideal targets. After taking custody of Felipe or Terrence, what if Calkins decided to take both of them and dump them somewhere in the Florida Everglades? And then both men, for whatever reason, ended up dying out there before they made it back home, with the cause of death being something like exposure or dehydration. Now, obviously, being given a starlight tour in sunny Florida is a lot different than receiving one in Saskatchewan in minus 30 degree weather. But I think this theory would explain so much about Calkins' actions. I have no idea if Calkins was the kind of cop who gave people starlight tours, but like I said earlier, people who are subjected to this type of treatment generally don't complain to the police. For all we know, Calkins had done this several times and no one ever found out about it. Let's envision a hypothetical scenario where Calkins takes Felipe Santos on a starlight tour, leaves him somewhere in the Florida Everglades, and Felipe dies out there for some other reason. Calkins then concocts a bullshit story about dropping Felipe off at the Circle K, but when Felipe is reported missing, Calkins doesn't suspect that the guy might be dead. Being that Felipe is an undocumented Mexican national who has been cited for numerous traffic violations, Calkins just assumed that the guy has gone into hiding or fled back home to Mexico to avoid his legal troubles. This might explain why Calkins would be so brazen as to pull the same thing with Terrence Williams only three months later. Calkins then decides to give Terrence another starlight tour into the Everglades, and Terrence winds up dying out there. But Calkins, he just doesn't have any inkling of this until Terrence is reported missing, which is why he is unable to dream up a more plausible cover story that is not riddled with holes. Now, obviously, the starlight tour theory isn't a perfect one. It's still a pretty major coincidence that two different people could die under these circumstances within three months, and it's still pretty troubling that neither of their bodies have been found. But I wouldn't discount the possibility that once the shit hit the fan, Calkins could have gone back to the original locations where he dropped off the two men, found their bodies, and managed to hide them somewhere before a search could be performed of the area. I know I might be stretching things here, but under the circumstances, I find it more plausible that Calkins might have committed two cases of negligent homicide, rather than two cases of premeditated murder. And even if this theory is true, and Calkins technically didn't murder these men himself, he still showcased major negligence by stranding them out there in the middle of nowhere, and he deserves to face the consequences. But thankfully, even though police departments often have a tendency to cover up misconduct like this, that doesn't seem to be the case with the Collier County Sheriff's Department. Sure, they probably could have taken Felipe's disappearance a lot more seriously at first, but once they found out that Calkins had two people vanish under his watch, they did not hesitate to take the necessary action to investigate him and discipline him, and they brought in the FBI to avoid any possible conflict of interest with investigating one of their own officers. Uh, if this department ever finds out that Calkins was responsible for the deaths of either of these men, I am willing to believe that they will do the right thing and charge him with something. Even if Steve Calkins didn't mean any intentional harm, his unethical behavior just gives police officers everywhere a bad name, and it should not be tolerated. And with that, we've reached the conclusion of this very strange episode. Uh, if you happen to have any important information about the disappearances of Felipe Santos or Terrence Williams, which has never been shared, uh, please contact the appropriate authorities. Remember, Tyler Perry, he's still offering a $100,000 reward for information which could help close this case, so if you have something important you need to tell anybody, please do so.
But if you just have your own theory about what might have happened to these two men, I'd love to hear from you. Hell, if you have some information... Hell, if you have some interesting information that wasn't covered here, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email. I can be reached at robin.warder at primus.ca. That's R-O-B-I-N dot W-A-R-D-E-R at P-R-I-M-U-S dot C-A. Robin.warder at primus.ca. And be sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and iTunes. And you can also check out a lot of my true crime and mystery articles, both at crack.com and listverse.com. And there's plenty of other non-true crime content I've written, which you can find right here at the back row. So until the next episode, have yourself a good two weeks, and join me next time for another edition of The Trail Went Cold. The Trail Went Cold is part of the Back Row Podcast Network. Visit the-back-row.com for more. The theme song was composed by Vince Nitro. Thank <laughs> you.